today, well, the cutting edge in science and in genetics is not genetics at all, it's epigenetics, mm -hmm. correct? So what you were doing 30 years ago was epigenetics. Was epigenetics. Yes. I wonder if you could tell the folks a little bit about the whole idea of epigenetics, what, how epigenetics relates to genetics, and how nutrition relates to epigenetics. Well, you have to appreciate how the medical mind thinks, pharmacists. Ben, you know this being right. a pharmacist. And, but for, for our viewers here, <clears throat> the medical mind is that they get a theory and everything belongs to that theory. For instance, back in the days of the cavemen, there were witch doctors and shamans. Everything was caused by evil spirits. Right. And then there was alchemists, and it had to do with distillation, turning, and, distillation yeah, yeah. turning lead into gold yeah, and all yeah. that kind of stuff and sprinkling. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, exactly, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And then it went into spontaneous generation because they didn't know about germs yet, and they thought that life spontaneously generated from nothing. And then along came Van Leeuwenhoek, the Dutch. Um, um, he was actually a spectacle maker, made eyeglasses. And he he invented the microscope. Yeah, but he put two lenses. Instead of one lens for your right eye, one eye for your left eye, he put one compound, lens on top it, of the other. Made a compound lens. Yeah, made a, a compound microscope, and he looked at pond water. He sees all these little animals floating around. He writes it up. Well, Pasteur gets, he's, he's a, um, a guy who's working on wine, trying to keep it from going sour I and going to vinegar. That, yeah. And that's he came he up with pasteurization. Yeast. He was studying yeast. Yeah, he was studying yeast, exactly. And so um, once he learned that it was a living thing, he couldn't see it because he didn't have a microscope. Once he had a microscope, he could see the little, little yeast buds and budding and growing. So Pasteur was a contemporary. Oh, yeah, of Van Leeuwenhoek. Okay. Yep. And... Um, uh, he immediately knew that spontaneous generation was not the thing. He knew things were caused by these germs. That's where the germ theory right. came from. And then, of course, um, he was the first one to actually practically make vaccines, although there was a, a medical doctor in England by the name of Jenner who was involved. Got a smallpox guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so um, uh, um, when you had Pasteur, uh, he actually had to, he took 25 sheep in the center of Paris. He set up pens, artificial pens or temporary pens. He had 25 sheep that he vaccinated for anthrax. He had 25 sheep he didn't. He gave anthrax to all 50. And the ones that were vaccinated, uh, 24 of them survived and one died. And the ones that didn't have vaccinated, they all died. And so the press was there and it was, uh, everybody agreed that he knew the answer to anthrax. And so the medical system couldn't argue with it because the press had already made it a feat accompli, right? And um, then comes along Mendel in Darwin, right? And Darwin's talking about how things evolve in the Galapagos Islands, and he'd see all these different finches, which are really the same species, but they had different colors and different beaks, but they're the same species. And that's because it took a little adaption in each of the different islands to survive, the predators and things. That's where he came up with the theory of evolution, by He's, watching the finches? Well, watching the finches. Uh -huh. That's where he got that idea. And he knew there was something being passed on from one generation because they could, the ones who were successful had some adaption, right? That was the word, adaption. And the ones that couldn't adapt got eaten by the predators. This is the beginnings of the genetic theory. Yeah, There's exactly. something being passed on, some information passed on from parent to offspring. Exactly. And then here's Mendel, who's this monk, right? And he's growing peas, and he's studying peas, which the monks loved to eat. And he was studying which he could get the best peas. And he learned that there was something being passed on, the, the color of the pea flowers, um, and the, whether they're wrinkled or smooth, or they're big or they're small, and he could pass on these traits. And so he, he talked about threads, and he knew that something was being passed on. He, he literally said threads? Mm -hmm. He said threads are being passed on, threads of life are being passed on, carrying information was his words. Wow. We're talking about in the, early, in the early 1800s, yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, and so that was the beginning of the genetic theory. Along comes people like uh, Linus Pauling and Watson and Crick, and they were able to uh, actually tell you the structure of a chromosome and so forth and double helix and how traits like eye color and skin color and hair color are being passed on and so forth. The Linus gender. Pauling was in on the whole genetic oh, thing as well. Well, he was the first, he was actually the first one. He was actually cheated in my, um, he should have actually gotten part of that Nobel Prize that Watson and Crick did because he came up with the helix he before the, oh yeah. Wow. He proposed that 10 years before they came along. They were just in their 20s and he proposed it 10 years earlier. Wow. And, but they were actually able to do it and, and show it. But so he really should have gotten uh, some part of that Nobel Prize, but he didn't. But at any rate, um, then along comes all the genome thing, right? So I know suddenly now genetics is going to solve everything. Right. They're just every every right. time they have a new theory, it solves everything. Right, 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 right. 
uh, came, and of course the genetic theory was fought for a long time, uh, just like the Earth is flat theory was tried to be defended by the holders of that theory until Columbus came along, who was an ignorant Portuguese um, seaman, right? He said the Earth was not flat. He, he, no, was, he's the guy sailing out there. Yeah, he knew yeah, the yeah, Earth yeah. wasn't yeah. flat. And so um, it, it comes down to perceptions and what you know and so forth. They're, they were limited. So at any rate, um, uh, my revelation, if you will, back when I was nine years old, the diseases could be caused by nutritional deficiency. Kind of, I, I learned everything I could about nutrition. Of course, in agriculture school, we learned that we could prevent and cure as many as 900 different diseases in animals with nutrition that in medical school they tell them are genetic. Did you know that there was a, it was really a nutritional and epigenetic component, that the nutrition was actually changing the genes? Yes, well, no, we didn't have the word epigenetic Did at you know that time. nutrition was changing the genes, though, that there were, the nutrition, lack of nutrition was affecting the genetics? And now that's a better word, affecting. Okay, they weren't changing the genes. Affecting. Affecting because the genes are like a factory. The chromosomes are like a factory. Can you build any factory without raw materials or, or parts? No. Uh, without uh, labors and energy? Of course not. No. no. Okay, so the, a, a gene and a chromosome is the same way. It's just a blueprint. Right. A gene and a chromosome is just a blueprint, right. nothing else. So you right. put a gene and a chromosome in a bucket of saline and say, okay, come on, boys, go to work and make something. Ain't nothing happening. Right. You still the gene need, that makes protein, the blueprint is just there to make the protein. You still need the raw materials to make the protein. That's right. Yeah. And so um, we learned in agricultural school that we could prevent and cure every disease you can think of. We can prevent and cure, um, well, let's see, we can prevent every birth defect. Many of them you could cure. Some of them, like cleft palates, a surgical case, right? And uh, for instance, congestive heart failure, the most common cause of heart disease, a death in adults in America, it's, it's a... Um, deficiency of a single vitamin. In fact, when I went to the next thing after the foxes in the Brookfield Zoo, uh, the Shedd Aquarium there in uh, Chicago, they called me over and said, hey, we hear you're wanting to do autopsies on some cetaceans, which are whales and dolphins and things. I said, yep. They said, well, we got a freshwater dolphin here from the Ganges River in India, just died, and we get 10 or 12 of them every year and by, in the spring and by the fall they're all dead. This is pretty typical. Why don't you give us your thoughts of what's happening here? So I go over there and cut that thing open, first thing I, I knew immediately what it was. Because the heart of a 300 pound freshwater dolphin is as big as your fist. Well, this dolphin's heart was as big as a basketball. He died of congestive heart failure, which is a deficiency of a single vitamin. So I said, are you giving these dolphins any vitamins? No, we're feeding them whole fish. They eat fish, so we just give them whole fish. I said, tell me what species of fish, because there are certain fish in their tissues, they have an enzyme that kills that vitamin. You're not talking about vitamin C? No. Thiamine. Thiamine. Thiaminase. Uh -huh. There's a thiaminase in the tissue of smelt. And they're feeding because of the size. The smelt was the perfect food from size standpoint for these freshwater dolphins. They, were, they didn't have any thiamine. They didn't have any thiamine because they weren't putting wow. a multiple and extra thiamine in the mouth of those fish when they fed them to the little uh, freshwater dolphins. So you know, told them to change the type of fish they were feeding them, give them multiple and some extra B vitamins with a lot of thiamine. Stop the deaths in the freshwater That's dolphins great. of the Shedd Aquarium. And so these are the things I could do with nutrition. And here's all these biologists. I mean, these guys are very skilled, very well-trained bi biologists when it came to behavior of the animals and, and um, their dynamics in captivity and so on and how they reacted uh, um, for territories with one male right. against the other, that kind of stuff. Behavioralists. Yeah, kind of exactly. But they weren't biochemists. They were biologists, but they weren't biochemists. They were biologists, but they weren't biochemists. Yeah. And so I could come in and see something very simple that I've been studying for 10, 15, 20 years and see it in a heartbeat where they could look at it and they couldn't recognize it. Now, thyme is a fascinating mm -hmm. vitamin. Mm -hmm. That's the berry berry vitamin. Exactly. That's the vitamin that they were given. Tell yeah. the story about the chickens and the, and the rice polishings. Well, um, berry berry is a very interesting disease. Uh, sailors, of course, used to die from this by the thousands every year. And as they went around the world and, and their sea voyages were longer and longer and longer, um, more and more sailors. I mean, two-thirds of the crew would be death from beriberi by the time they came home, particularly as, as time went along because uh, they demanded modern food. And modern food to them meant polished rice, white rice instead of brown rice, uh, because that's what rich people ate, and so they wanted that as part of their demand. If we're going to go on this long sea voyage, we want polished rice. Okay. And uh, two-thirds of the crew would die from beriberi. Well, first of all, they get a dementia called Korsakoff syndrome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. which is caused by a thiamine deficiency. Yeah. And then we get congestive heart failure. It's like a cure for Korsakoff syndrome is thiamine. I they cure just... people in a week. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing, right? But I give them 26,000 times the minimum daily requirement. <laughs> I hedge my bet, right? 
Okay, so at any rate, um, uh, just uh, all these diseases that um, these Japanese naval surgeons were really the first ones to recognize there's some problem here when they fed these sailors this polished rice. But the admiralty, you know, the big guys up there, the admiralty, well, listen, these guys are demanding this. This has nothing to do with it. It's got to be some bug. They thought it was a bug. Wow. What year are we talking here? Uh, we're talking about the late 1700s. Wow. Okay, in the 18th century. And, um, and Europeans get the credit for discovering it, but it was really the Japanese the Polish, naval surgeon. It was a Polish chemist. Kaiser Funk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who yeah, came was up his name, yeah. But, well, he, he actually identified it. But before that, the Japanese naval surgeons, there was something in there. they knew there was something yeah. in, in the bran of the rice, in the brown covering, the hull on the rice was, right. could prevent and reverse that disease. And they would all die of congestive heart failure, but they would all go crazy. They'd lose their minds, Korsakoff syndrome, yeah. before they died and of congestive alcohol, heart failure. people who drink alcohol, that deactivates thiamine somehow. Well, sure. Well, it, it, well, alcohol is a liquid sugar, and it makes thiamine's it... Thiamine is used for metabolizing the alcohol. And so when you take in sugar or alcohol, yeah. it makes a deficiency worse. Talk about ADD, maybe. How about B1 deficiency, subclinical B1 deficiency for kids who have ADD? They're eating sugar. Maybe, th maybe, maybe they don't need Ritalin. Maybe they need something like, like thiamine. Or how about subclinical issues? You know, we talk about the big things like congestive heart failure and beriberi. But what, what are the impacts of subclinical thiamine deficiency, where maybe they're just not getting enough thiamine? What are the impacts on our kids? And okay, well, that's a good one. Let's talk about ADD, ADHD, autism. Uh, back when I was a kid, there was no such thing as those things, right? Um, in the year um, uh, two, uh, let's see, 1980. In 1980, it was one out of um, 150,000 kids had autism. In the year 2000, it's one out of 150. Today, it's one out of 88 is the new, it just came out last week. Wow. Uh, one out of 88 now has autism. Wow. And basically, when I was a kid, all four of my grandparents were from Eastern Europe. They were beet farmers and, and beef farmers. And so for breakfast, I would have cheese and beets and beef and eggs and... No uh, Cheerios? Uh, no. No cornflakes? <laughs> no. Not when I was a little baby. Nope. And um, uh, we didn't have those types of diseases. Well, here comes now... Um, 20 years later, kids are being fed on these box cereals full of carbohydrate, processed carbohydrates with sugar on it, and they're getting apple juice. Right. How can you build a brain, which is two-thirds by weight, 75% by weight, is cholesterol and good fats, okay? And so now all they're getting is carbohydrates and sugar, and they're going crazy. Right. It's yes. not only they're deficient, but it's costing them nutrients to process all that stuff. Exactly. So it makes the nutritional deficiencies worse. Even worse, right. Right. And so, uh, simply, I take kids that haven't spoken in 11 years. You start feeding them eggs, you get them on the 90 essential nutrients, which is what we feed animals, the right. 90 essential nutrients, 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, 3 essential fatty acids. And after 11 years of not speaking, I have kids who can read the Bible out loud in churches. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Doc, I say this on my radio show all the time. I say, you're going to think it's a miracle, but it's not a miracle. This is the way the body works because yep. you give the body what it needs and it will respond. This amazing system, this amazing divine system. Well, that's the end of our broadcast. I'm David Knight. Please join us tomorrow on the InfoWars Nightly News.